our prehistory is 100% listener funded, so please consider becoming a patron of the show. For $3 a month, you gain access to exclusive episodes, maps, and timelines. Your support allows our exploration of prehistory to continue. To become a patron, click on the link in the description of this episode, or go to patreon.com slash ourprehistory. Eight circular tents stood on a south-facing slope near a wide river. Three of them were larger than the others, and had vertical walls and a conical roof, supported by a lattice of small tree stems. Gray and reddish-brown firs were tied to these structures, and were held to the ground with a ring of heavy stones. This small, temporary village had been assembled a month ago, and was full of people sitting at firesides as dusk neared. Outside one of the smaller tents, two women sat on large stones as their children played nearby. They'd been close friends ever since they'd moved east to join this clan as young brides. Their families would sleep under the same roof until spring. One of them struck a piece of pyrite with another stone to produce a spark, which landed on a bundle of dry fibers, while the other carved a small piece of ivory into the outline of a woman. Just as she was finishing her figurine, a dog barked. The woman left her friend, thinking that the animal just wanted some attention. But as she walked around the tent, she saw the reason for the bark. Two young men were approaching the village, large packs on their backs. They raised a hand in greeting, but she did not recognize their faces. After speaking her tribe's customary words of greeting, she asked the travelers from where they'd come. One of the men with a friendly face responded with a similar greeting, and announced that their journey had begun by the waters where the sun set. He spoke a different dialect than the woman, but she understood his meaning and knew of the western sea. The second man asked respectfully whether they might meet with her clan leader. Interested to learn more about these foreigners, she pointed them towards a tent at the far side of the village. As they walked, she wondered if these young men would be allowed to stay here for the winter, and hoped that they bore news of her kin in the West. This woman lived 16,000 years ago, on the eastern bank of the Rhine River in Germany. She belonged to a tribe of the late Magdalenian period, when long-distance ideological and material exchange thrived between hunter-gatherers in Western and Central Europe. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 19, Magdalenian Expansion. From 20,000 to 14,000 years ago, the people of Western Europe followed the Magdalenian way of life and are known today for their prolific antler carving and cave painting. At its start, this culture was limited to southern France and Iberia, but by its end, hunter-gatherers had colonized large parts of Central and Northern Europe. As the Magdalenian world expanded, it remained highly interconnected, and new hunting weapons and artistic themes spread rapidly and extensively across it. Today, we will be primarily focused on the cultural changes and human migrations of the late Magdalenian, which covers the final 2,000 years of this culture. During the last glacial maximum, humans mostly disappeared from northwestern Europe, including Britain, Belgium, northern France, and eventually all of Germany and Switzerland. For 6,000 years, 
This tundra was only rarely visited by people, probably as they followed herds of reindeer during unusually warm decades. But then, around 19,000 years ago, the ice sheets began their retreat, and after a few centuries, incursions north of the Alps became more common. Compared to previous human migrations, such as those out of Africa, we have much more detailed information about the process of human movement northward after the last glacial maximum. Between 19,000 and 16,500 years ago, there was an early, limited phase of expansion. During this phase, Magdalenian society was flourishing in southwestern Europe, and productive grasslands were slowly moving northward. From population centers such as Dordogne and the Pyrenees, people began to spread to eastern France. From there, a small number of groups continued moving northeast into the Swiss Plateau, which had been completely covered by ice during the last glacial maximum. But by 17,300 years ago, the glaciers had retreated, and Magdalenian camps appeared around the rivers and lakes of this region. As they continued to move along the northern edge of the Alps, following herds of horse and reindeer, some bands of foragers quickly reached the Danube River in southern Germany. Stunningly, some kept moving eastward for more than 1,000 kilometers until they reached the plains of southern Poland, north of the Carpathian Mountains. Here, the remains of a Magdalenian camp at Masika Cave have been confidently dated to 18,500 years ago. We don't know how long this migration took, but the scarcity of archaeological remains between eastern France and Poland from this time suggests that these migrants moved quickly. The fact that the occupants of Masika or their ancestors had once lived in France is supported by their use of specific tools and art. They made shuttle-like pieces of bone and carved phallic sculptures on pierced batons, similar to those we spoke about last time, which were made in central France by an early Magdalenian tribe. The strong contemporaneous cultural similarity between France and Poland around 18,500 years ago is remarkable and is a clear example of a long-distance relocation of hunter-gatherers, moving across land mostly unoccupied by other people. The initial migrations around the northern periphery of the Alps did not result in long-term settlement. Only a small number of Magdalenian camps have been found in Switzerland, Germany, and Poland before 16,500 years ago. These migrants may have moved back southward after harsh winters, or died out after a few generations trying to survive on the lonely frontier. Groups of less than 150 people are not likely to establish a sustained population in a new location without the arrival of more migrants, due to the negative effects of inbreeding and low genetic diversity. The second phase of Magdalenian expansion began around 16,300 years ago. This colonization was much more significant. Large numbers of people from eastern France moved along the same migration route as earlier. Within a couple centuries, several clusters of Magdalenian bands had settled from Switzerland to southern Poland. Whereas this wave of people primarily moved eastward, subsequent dispersals a few centuries later progressed northward. A major access of this travel was the Rhine River. Following this waterway, people reached the low countries of Europe, creating dense settlements in Belgium by about 15,500 years ago. Other bands followed a second route along the Loire River to reach the Paris Basin of northern France, which was colonized by 15,000 years ago. Finally, the last wave of Magdalenian expansion came 14,700 years ago and reached Britain, the Netherlands, northern Germany, and Denmark. The fact that these colonists originated in southwestern Europe 
is confirmed by genetic evidence. DNA extracted from the bones of five people who died between 16,000 and 14,000 years ago in eastern France, Germany, Belgium, and Britain shows that they were closely related to each other. More importantly, they belong to the same genetic lineage as three much older individuals from Western Europe. The first lived 19,000 years ago in northern Spain, during the early Magdalenian. The second lived 23,000 years ago in southern Spain during the Salutrian. And the third lived 36,000 years ago in Belgium during the Aurignacian. This means that all Magdalenians for which we have DNA, including northern colonists, are descendants of a group of people who had been present in Western Europe since the Aurignacian and had survived in Iberia during the last glacial maximum. Most Magdalenian migrants were moving into virgin lands, unoccupied by other humans. But those that moved the furthest east, arriving in the valleys of Moravia and the open plains around the Vistula River of Poland, may have found other groups of foragers already living there. These were people using Epigravetian types of tools, who had arrived slightly earlier from the southeast. Archaeologists differentiate these groups based on differences in how they prepared stone cores for producing blades. We know little about the nature of the encounter between these long-separated Western and Eastern Europeans. We don't have genetic information yet for this period in Poland or the Czech Republic, which might be able to tell us to what degree these two populations mixed. However, archaeological remains hold little evidence of cultural exchange between Magdalenians and Epigravetians. The presence of exotic stone from Epigravetian territories in some Magdalenian camps may hint at occasional trade between these groups. But the first brief appearance of Magdalenians at Masika left little impact on the region. Then, when Magdalenian tools and art arrived again in Poland around 16,200 years ago, they replaced local Epigravetian customs and remained completely distinct from those of tribes to their east and south in the Carpathian Basin and Ukrainian lowlands. The lack of mixing of Magdalenian and Epigravetian artifacts in the campsites of these people leads most experts to believe that a significant migration of people from the west overwhelmed the local inhabitants, either pushing them out or quickly assimilating them. The absence of adoption of napping techniques or symbolic styles of one group by the other is notable. Once in Poland, Magdalenian tribes moved no further east, and for 2,000 years avoided further contact with Epigravetians. It seems that a cultural barrier had emerged between West and East, after 10,000 years of separation caused by the last glacial maximum. A closer look at the bands of hunter-gatherers who colonized Central Europe reveals some of the principles that underlie their success. Interestingly, these colonists usually set up camp within 10 kilometers of two natural features, major rivers and outcrops of high-quality stone. For migrants moving into unknown territory, clear landmarks like the Rhine and Danube rivers were essential for navigating. In addition, they maintained the core Magdalenian custom of producing long blades, for which they required large blocks of fine-grained stone. Camps along the Rhine and in Switzerland reveal both a high level of organization and a commitment to Magdalenian traditions. Much like people in France, in the summer they dispersed into small bands and moved frequently, but during the fall and winter they gathered in groups of 30 to 60 and organized mass hunts of reindeer that were migrating to their wintering grounds. In these temporary villages they built several tents, probably with wooden pole frames covered by animal furs. The circular and rectangular arrangements of stones used to anchor the walls 
can sometimes be identified by archaeologists. These structures could reach substantial dimensions, six meters in diameter. Floors were paved with stone, and the area outside of the tents was clearly organized into spaces for different purposes. An area for butchering reindeer, several garbage piles on the edge of camp, pits for storage, fires around which cooking and the repairing of hunting weapons was common, and spaces further from the fires where other crafts like hideworking took place. Another element of camp life shared across the Magdalenian world was the presence of dogs. The Eurasian wolf, the wild progenitor of dogs, had been domesticated by 17,000 years ago. The bones of 10 Magdalenian dogs, which can be distinguished from those of wolves, have been discovered in Spain, France, Switzerland, Germany, and England, suggesting that they were common by the time of the Magdalenian expansion. Domestication occurs when humans come to control or influence the reproduction of a species to the point that genetic changes occur. As a result of domestication, the first dogs became less aggressive and smaller than wolves. They also quickly evolved to have shorter snouts than those of their wild cousins. As with other domesticated species, dogs grew to be dependent on humans, and the carbon and nitrogen isotopes in their bones show that their diet changed. Domestication is not the same as keeping wild animals as pets which probably was common during the Upper Paleolithic before the Magdalenian, as it is among hunter-gatherers today. Wild wolf pups had probably been adopted ever since people arrived in Eurasia. We don't know if the breeding of wolves to create dogs was an intentional decision by humans, or whether it was an unintended result of wolves growing accustomed to feeding on human waste. Regardless, at some point, bands of people saw the value of systematically incorporating these animals into their groups and caring for them. Frustratingly, we don't know when or where dogs were first domesticated. China, the Middle East, Siberia, and Europe have all been proposed as locations for this event, but genetic studies of ancient dogs and wolves have not provided a conclusive answer. One theory that is not yet confirmed is that wolves were domesticated as early as the Gravedian, around 33,000 years ago, based on bones from Pavlovian settlements in Moravia. However, it's difficult to differentiate the bones of an early dog from those of a wolf. Dogs were the first species to be domesticated. We often associate this phenomenon with the development of agriculture. But dogs are the single exception, not domesticated by sedentary farmers, but by nomadic hunter-gatherers. These animals may have guarded humans from predators, aided them in hunting, or simply provided them with affection and entertainment. The ancient character of the bond between humans and dogs is most poignantly demonstrated at a 14,100-year-old Magdalenian camp on the Rhine River, where a young woman and an old man were buried in the same grave as a six-month-old puppy. The migration of people around 16,300 years ago spread the Magdalenian approach to survival. Colonists were not changing their way of life to adapt to a new environment but simply applying the successful Magdalenian formula to Central Europe, which was transforming into a rich steppe, like the one where this culture had emerged. As large herbivores moved northward into these growing grasslands, these people followed. Those who arrived on the banks of the Rhine and Danube rivers replicated the hunting strategies, technology, and decorative customs of people in France and Spain. They primarily hunted reindeer and horse, but supplemented these food sources with smaller animals, including birds, rabbits, fish, foxes, and occasionally megafauna like woolly rhinoceros. They carved antler and bone with skill, 
using typical Magdalenian stone tools. Naturalistic depictions of animals on small, portable objects remained popular among the descendants of these pioneers. Drawings on stone plaques of reindeer, horse, bison, and many other animals have been discovered at Magdalenian camps in Switzerland, Germany, and the Czech Republic. As far east as Poland, people perpetuated the use of mysterious Magdalenian discs made of bone and spear points made from half-round rods of antler. Both were decorated with similar engraved designs as in France. Even the tradition of decorating spear throwers with carvings of horse heads continued north of the Alps. Other innovations belonging to the late Magdalenian also spread widely across Western and Central Europe. The long-distance dispersal of ideas was possible because colonists and their descendants maintained contact with tribes in the Magdalenian heartland through a continuous network of bands. Details of these connections can be recreated by tracing the transport of materials. The objects that traveled the furthest through Magdalenian trade networks were ornaments. The most notable of these were Mediterranean and Atlantic seashells, which were transported as far as the Rhine and Danube rivers, more than 1,000 kilometers from their nearest possible point of origin. The movement of shells across Western Europe during the late Magdalenian has been carefully mapped. Some were collected on the coasts and others as fossils in inland geological deposits. Their final destinations reveal complex networks of exchange, moving in many different directions. Another material used for ornaments whose origin can be traced is jet, a type of fossilized coal. Jet is shiny and black and became a popular material from which to produce beads, pendants, and discs among Magdalenian tribes on the northern foothills of the Alps. Here it was collected in large quantities and transported up to 500 kilometers to the south and east. Given the frequency of long-distance transport, the trade of luxury items must have become a common aspect of Magdalenian life. The maps of shell and jet transport reveal that the Swiss plateau was an important hub of this trade. People in this region had connections with many other tribes, including with those around the Rhone to the west, the Paris Valley to the northwest, the Rhine to the north, and the Danube to the northeast. In comparison to ornaments, stone used for tools usually did not travel as far, rarely more than 300 kilometers, which suggests that it was mostly carried by individuals as they moved from camp to camp. It seems that Magdalenian trade was focused more on symbolically important objects than economically useful materials. Exotic and unique ornaments were valued and may have served to elevate or reinforce the standing of tribal leaders. The mechanism of this trade is unclear. A necklace of bright red Mediterranean shells may have been moved through several intermediaries before arriving at the banks of the Rhine. Alternatively, ornaments may have been carried by single individuals, making a long distance trip far beyond their home territory. At least one case of a lengthy journey is revealed by six stone plaques found at a winter camp in Germany. On these plaques, a person engraved images of seals with such accuracy that they themselves must have seen these marine creatures most likely on the Atlantic coast of France. The extent of long-distance trade demonstrates that by hunter-gatherer standards, Western Europe during the late Magdalenian was an exceptionally united society that facilitated the movement of individuals between groups. This culture encouraged hospitality towards strangers, which was facilitated by similar languages and spiritual beliefs. An understanding of the world beyond their own tribe's hunting grounds was widespread. Stories told by campfires along the Rhine and Danube may have described ancestral migrations from the southwest. The environment also facilitated movement. 
flat grasslands are relatively easy to traverse compared to forests, deserts, or mountains. The cultural openness following the Magdalenian expansion allowed people and ideas to flow freely on the Western European steppe. The period of Magdalenian expansion was also a time of technological change. Several new types of tools and weapons were invented, and others fell out of use. Around 16,500 years ago, people making antler points in southern France shifted from single beveled to double beveled bases, reflecting a different way of constructing spears. The new pointed bases were slotted into a split end of a wooden spear shaft. Also, the practice of carving grooves along the length of antler points became less common, which may be related to the adoption of a new type of microlith attached as barbs on spear tips. These microliths were shaped into scalene triangles of impressive standardization and became a characteristic component of late Magdalenian toolkits from Spain to Poland. After 16,500 years ago, groups living on the Atlantic coast continued to collect whalebone and transported it inland, mostly to the foothills of the Pyrenees. But in this connected Magdalenian world, whalebone was traded to bands living as far as the Rhine. Interestingly, the type of tool produced from this material changed during the transition to the late Magdalenian. Unlike the preceding thousand years, whalebone was not converted into a point, but into a piece of equipment called a foreshaft. Whalebone foreshafts were probably components of complex spears, and were used as a connecting piece between a point made of antler and a shaft made of wood. They were cylindrical, and around 15 centimeters long. The ends were shaped to fit together with the other pieces. The end that attached to the point was often double beveled and inserted into a fork-based point. These multi-component spears made of wood, whalebone, and antler are excellent examples of the complexity of Magdalenian technology. The purpose of foreshafts is unclear. They may have lowered the risk of damage to the valuable wooden shaft, or simply serve to extend the length of the spear point. Some experts believe that foreshafts did not possess any functional value, and were purely an aesthetic choice. Foreshafts were sometimes decorated with intricate zigzag carvings. Spears with long decorated points may have been items of prestige, owned by proud hunters. Possibly the most interesting change to weaponry at the start of the late Magdalenian was the invention of barbed points, sometimes referred to as harpoons. Typically between 10 and 20 centimeters long, these skillfully carved pieces of antler boasted one or two rows of pointed barbs along its length. Their rounded bases were inserted into a socket at the end of a spear shaft. Antler workers used elegant engravings to embellish these weapons. Magdalenian barbed points were probably invented around 16,000 years ago, and this technology spread rapidly through the entire Magdalenian world, from southern Spain through central Europe to Poland. Barbed points did not replace traditional antler points, but provided hunters with a different type of weapon. In France, barbed points account for about a quarter of the antler hunting weapons during the late Magdalenian. We don't know for sure how barbed points were used, but the most popular theory is that they tipped the end of fishing spears. Their design is similar to that of harpoons, whose barbs are intended to embed securely in a fish or marine mammal, like a seal. However, the word harpoon refers specifically to projectiles attached to a rope, and there is little evidence that Magdalenian barbed points were used in this way. Even if these weapons were not technically harpoons, most archaeologists believe that they were an innovation specifically designed to capture fish. The remains of fish bones at Magdalenian camps in Iberia, France, and Germany show that fishing was a common activity likely practiced seasonally during the spring spawning. 
another piece of equipment may have been developed to improve the efficiency of this task. At a handful of sites in Spain and Germany, tiny items of bone appear during the late Magdalenian that resemble a form of fishing equipment called gorges, which are known from other prehistoric and modern cultures. Only about two centimeters long, gorges are straight pegs with sharp points at each end, and designed to become lodged in a fish's gullet. Gorges are the predecessor to fish hooks and are used in a similar manner. Dozens of these small items have been found at Spanish sites, alongside the bones of marine fish. Around 17,500 years ago, the exploitation of aquatic resources in Western Europe expanded to include marine mammals. The bones of seals, dolphins, and whales have been discovered at a small number of Magdalenian camps, which is extremely rare earlier in the Upper Paleolithic. We've already mentioned the whale bone found at dozens of sites, but at 10 caves in Spain and France, dolphin and whale teeth and vertebrae were used as ornaments or sculpted into figurines. Even more significant, at eight coastal sites, seal bones have been found, sometimes in large numbers. For example, at two different caves, there's evidence for the butchery of at least seven individual seals. At one of these camps, seal meat was carried about four kilometers from the shore. The most logical explanation for these findings is that some Magdalenian bands living near the coast were intentionally hunting seals and scavenging from carcasses of beached whales and dolphins. The increasing importance of aquatic animals for the people of Western Europe left its mark on Magdalenian art. At 15 different camps, some of them hundreds of kilometers from the ocean, engravings, paintings, and sculptures of seals and whales have been discovered, some in exquisite detail and accuracy. During the late Magdalenian, fish were drawn on portable art and cave walls more often than in preceding periods. For example, in Cantabria, 5% of animal drawings on Magdalenian stone plaques and bone tools are of fish. One of the most famous depictions of marine animals is that of a halibut from Pileta Cave in southern Spain. Notable for its size, about one and a half meters long, this fish was skillfully and accurately depicted in black paint. The presence of fish, seal, whale, and dolphin in the late Magdalenian diet and iconography reveals a gradual increase in their economic and ideological relevance. The invention of barbed antler points may have been driven by the need for more effective fishing spears. The term hunter-gatherer has sometimes been critiqued by academics, who believe the phrase hunter-gatherer-fisher to be a more accurate characterization of some prehistoric peoples, among whom we should count the Magdalenians. Aside from fish and seal, other new artistic themes and motifs appeared during the late Magdalenian. Some are limited to single tribes in certain areas, while others spread throughout all of Western and Central Europe. The most significant change to artistic norms provide fascinating insights into the Magdalenian mind. One design that appeared around 16,500 years ago was that of thick engraved lines in zigzag patterns on spear points from central France to Cantabria. A more localized design was that of an abstract and simplified depiction of an ibex or deer head, drawn from a frontal perspective. The ibex motif was mostly drawn by groups in Cantabria, while deer were more common in the Pyrenean foothills. Among bands living in the Dordogne region, fish-like symbols became common decorations on tools. In Germany and France, drawings and sculptures of grasshoppers and beetles mark the first clear depiction of insects in Europe. Much like the rest of the Upper Paleolithic, large mammals dominated late Magdalenian art. Horse continued to be a popular animal 
to engrave on portable objects. But in France, the style of drawings of the mane changes from several vertical hatch marks to two long horizontal lines. When it comes to the depiction of humans, interesting trends emerged. Last time, we saw that realistic human portraits and simple faces were engraved by two different tribes in France around 18,500 years ago. By the late Magdalenian, those styles were abandoned and replaced by two completely different types of human depiction. One was strangely unique and concentrated in southern France, whereas the other was more universal and permeated nearly the entire range of Magdalenian influence. In both cases, the goal was not to portray the human form accurately. First, human-animal hybrids became a particular interest to people living in southern France. This was part of a greater trend towards the drawing of imaginary creatures, including combinations of different animals, such as a reindeer with the feet of a duck. About 50 images of humans combined with animal features have been identified in Magdalenian cave and portable art. Among these are human heads with bird beaks and men with seal flippers. A repeated hybrid theme found at three different caves is that of a man standing on two legs bearing a tail and the head of a deer or bison with antlers or horns. The most famous of these is the so-called sorcerer of the Three Brothers Cave in the Pyrenees Mountains. This black painting is about 75 centimeters tall and was placed in a prominent position on a cave wall above several animals. It depicts a naked man with a horse tail and deer antlers. In the same cave, a similar engraving of a bison man plays a flute. These images are surreal and magical, eliciting a different emotional response from their audience than that created when viewing naturalistic drawings of animals. Common interpretations are that human-animal hybrids are depictions of Magdalenian shamans wearing animal costumes or characters in Magdalenian myths. Beings that are part human, part animal had been present in European ideology since the Lion Man of the Oryg Nation and reflects the animistic belief that the division between human and the natural world is fluid. The second trend in human representation during the late Magdalenian is the widespread appearance of stylized, headless women. Some were engraved into stone tablets or cave walls, while others were sculpted as small figurines. Sometimes called Venuses, they mark a major resurgence of female imagery in Europe for the first time since the Gravedian, about 10,000 years earlier. However, the Venus figurines and drawings of the Magdalenian were much less detailed than those of the Gravedian. Typically, they only show the profile of the body from the neck to the legs, excluding the head and feet. They are clearly female because of the accentuation of the hips and butt, and in some cases the presence of breasts. This type of image probably originated in the Dordogne region around 18,000 years ago, but became especially common and much more standardized at the start of the late Magdalenian, adopted as a popular icon by people from Cantabria to Poland. Figurines of this shape have been found at 17 Magdalenian camps, and engravings at 25 sites. It was especially popular among the new inhabitants of Germany and Switzerland, where stone figurines and small jet beads were shaped like headless women. One of the most interesting Magdalenian sites on the Rhine, Gonersdorf, possessed large quantities of these stylized Venuses. Gonersdorf was an aggregation site where 30 to 60 people spent the winter in a small village of tents. Many bone, antler, and ivory female figurines were carved during a single season. In addition, more than 400 images of women were engraved into stone tablets, including pairs or groups of women. One tablet of note shows four women in a line with one carrying a baby on her back. 
The re-emergence of female imagery during the late Magdalenian returns us to many of the ideas we discussed in our episode about Gravettian art, specifically the role of women in Upper Paleolithic society. I won't reiterate those arguments here, but I will note that Venuses appeared during two periods of growing population size, social complexity, and general artistic production, the golden ages of the Gravettian and Magdalenian. Yet the differences between these two expressions of female iconography hint at distinct objectives. Gravettian Venus figurines were individualized, realistic, and detailed whereas Magdalenian Venuses were anonymous and abstract. The older figurines displayed individuals, and the younger ones simply the concept of womanhood. The final evolution of Magdalenian culture took place around 15,000 years ago. By this date, artistic production was beginning to decline and a long process of technological simplification took hold in Europe. Both trends would accelerate after the end of the Magdalenian. The final thousand years of this culture saw the gradual disappearance of traditions that had defined the past 4,000 years of hunter-gatherer life in Europe. Since about 19,000 years ago, Magdalenians had made large blades using high-quality exotic stone. But by 15,000 years ago, people in France were making small blades, more often from local raw material. Also, they no longer used separate, specialized napping techniques for blades and bladelets. These trends indicate that stone working skill was decreasing in importance. At the same time, whalebone fell out of use, as did four shafts, forked based points, and half round rods diversity in organic tool production was declining. But not all Magdalenian customs were abandoned. Antler points remained in use and were armed with backed bladelets and scalene triangle microliths. The harpoon-like barbed points became even more common towards the end of the Magdalenian. Some groups start producing hunting weapons tipped with stone points, including tanged, leaf-shaped, and shouldered. The adoption of different varieties of stone points in different parts of the Magdalenian world hints at another tendency that began around 15,000 years ago, the greater regionalization of technology. Whereas Magdalenian methods of stone and antler working had once been shared across half the continent, this would no longer be the case after 14,000 years ago. A once united culture was fragmenting. So to what can we attribute these changes? Why did the diversity of the forager toolkit start to decline? We will talk more about this question when we cover the post-Magdalenian cultures, but environmental change probably played a significant role. During most of the Magdalenian, the warming of the planet that followed the glacial maximum had been slow and gradual, but around 14,700 years ago, the global temperatures increased by several degrees in only a few decades. Greenland warmed by 10 degrees Celsius in about 90 years. Sea levels rose by about 25 meters. This event began a 1,800-year-long climatic period called the bowling alarod interstadial. The increase in temperatures and rainfall led to hundreds of years of forest expansion. In Central Europe, cold-tolerant tree species such as birch and pine encroached upon the steppe. Grassland animals like reindeer and horse retreated to the north and east. For example, by the end of the bowling alarod, hunter-gatherer camps in Belgium no longer contain the remains of reindeer. In warmer parts of Europe, a different type of forest, one dominated by deciduous trees like oak, spread rapidly. Woodland animals like boar and roe deer began appearing in the camps of Magdalenian hunters in Cantabria. Ibex and red deer replaced reindeer as the main prey of people in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. 
hunter-gatherer life in warm woodlands is much different to that in cold grasslands, which had been the dominant ecosystem for the entire Magdalenian. This dramatic reorganization of the landscape forced people to change their way of life and contributed to the gradual disappearance of Magdalenian customs. As people in Europe were confronting the disappearance of reindeer and horse, the bowling alarod provided opportunities for those on the fringes of the Magdalenian world. In fact, the final centuries of the Magdalenian culture marked its greatest geographic extent. Increasing humidity around 15,000 years ago improved conditions in southern Iberia substantially, where arid ecosystems had previously dominated. People from Cantabria and southern France migrated southward into the interior of the peninsula and along the Mediterranean coast, where the population increased rapidly. Harpoons and naturalistic drawings of animals spread southward with these migrations. The bowling alarod warming also saw a major expansion of people into the northern plains of Europe. In this region, the warming resulted in the replacement of tundra by grasslands. Along the central Rhine Valley, the density of forager bands was growing, and some from that region decided to move northward, where they could now find stable populations of reindeer and horse. Here, in these northern plains, the Magdalenian way of life thrived. These bands were smaller and more mobile than those to the south, and many of them remained specialized reindeer hunters. These colonists composed the final wave of Magdalenian expansion, and arrived in the Netherlands, northern Germany, Denmark, and Britain. At the time, the North and Baltic seas did not exist, because sea levels were still lower than they are today. Britain was a peninsula of Europe, and the bridge of land which would eventually be flooded is today referred to as Doggerland. Magdalenians probably migrated from the Netherlands across Doggerland to reach Britain. Some of them might have stayed and lived on the rolling Doggerland plains. The migrants brought with them many Magdalenian customs, including methods of producing blades and harpoons. In British caves, images of red deer, aurochs, horses, and birds were painted in a naturalistic style reminiscent of contemporaneous paintings in Belgium. These pioneers also engraved fish and horses into ivory and bone tools, reflecting the persistence of the Magdalenian artistic canon. On this northern frontier, signs of cultural fragmentation appeared as new types of stone tools emerged. Shouldered points and a unique type of large stone piercer were adopted by groups in northern Germany and Denmark. This variation of the Magdalenian is sometimes called the Hamburgian culture. In Britain, people who arrived during the bowling warming formed the Cresswellian culture, which was characterized by small trapezoidal blades used as inserts in antler points. At 35 locations in England and Wales, Cresswellian blades have been discovered. Both the Cresswellian and Hamburgian were short-lived lasting at most 500 years, and probably much less. These people and their unique tools disappeared from the northern plains of Europe by 14,100 years ago, when a short cold phase affected Europe. The rise and fall of these cultures is a unique reminder of how fragile hunter-gatherer societies were, especially at the edge of human existence. During the final millennia of the Magdalenian, new lands had opened for human colonization, and the number of people in Western Europe had grown. Yet this period also witnessed a dramatic impoverishment of Upper Paleolithic art. By 15,000 years ago, people stopped decorating their spear throwers with sculptures of animals. Large-scale cave paintings and engravings in Europe essentially ended about 14,000 years ago, never again to be resumed. The drawing of animals in general became less common across Western Europe. Not only had the Magdalenian artistic golden age concluded, 
but a 25,000 year long practice of cave decoration was over. The end of this grand tradition should remind us that the quality of Magdalenian sculpture and painting should not be taken for granted. These achievements visible clearly today at Lascaux and Altamira were not components of many other prehistoric cultures. During the Magdalenia, artistic competence developed to great heights among bands of people who had been released from the grip of the Ice Age, whose numbers were growing, who traveled the open steppe, and who gathered in winter villages. They felt a strong connection to animals with whom they shared the land. Within this way of life lies the origin of a complex society that expressed its ambitions, fears, and beliefs in stunning works of art. In our next episode, we will catch up with developments in Eastern Europe, where the end of the last glacial maximum led to a reinvigoration of human society. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory.